about that being a problematic movie because uh, it is that. Yeah, but <laughs> honestly, like, like there's it's, there's there's some interesting things honestly going on. I don't know if it was intentional, but I I, I do want to talk about some like inter interesting ways it deals with like some of the characters. Yeah, that we'll get is into it. definitely problematic, but also I don't know. It, like again, I don't know if it was intentional, but there's like interesting things that it does. Okay, it. I'm curious to hear the subversive reading of of King Kong, but yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Well, right now, let's talk about let's talk about the movie of the year. The movie, movie of, the of the year. Movie of the summer. I, I alluded to it a few weeks ago, but everybody else has dived into the discourse more. So yeah, let's talk Triple R, baby. Yeah, I mean, after having seen it, like as soon as it ended, I was like, so that is the movie of the year, right? Like there's there's not another movie that's going to beat that this Literally year. Literally not another it's, movie. It's very rare that I have that experience. I think the last time I can remember having that experience was like, for me, when The Witch came out, which was like a January or a February movie. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, that's going to be my favorite movie of the year. No way anything is going to be better than that. And it turned out it didn't. Um, but Triple R is like, Whew, it, it is really uh, going for it. And it feels like it is working harder to be a great movie than almost any movie like attempts to, you know? Um, well, it was also like, I mean, we talked about it last time, but it's a three hour movie. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, like, I don't think I ever checked my watch, like my clock. To see it like, does oh, not how much stop is left? being like really it's, intense all the time. It's so engaging. Yeah. Like it's, in, it's, it's incredibly engaging for three hours. And literally once it ended, I was like, oh shit, it ended? <laughs> I think like Fury Road was like the watermark before. Like I don't think we've yeah. had a movie this hype that is like sustains that level of hype for as long as it does mm -hmm. since Fury Road. And this like, not to say this is a better movie than Fury Road necessarily, but it is even more impressive, I think, in some ways in terms of just like how hard it goes <laughs> for as long as it does. Oh yeah. Um, but I guess to give people, uh, uh, people who didn't listen to that last podcast, a really quick summary of what this movie even is. Fuck the um, British. <laughs> Fuck the British, the movie. Um, this is an Indian film uh, by this director, S.S. Rajamuli. I've not seen his other movies, but I now want to watch the Bahubali movies. Yeah, I, I want to watch. The, he, has the, he has that series of movies that I marked down because I kind of wanted to get into those. Yeah. I, I was reading that those are good entry points as well. Yeah, those were the movies that he was known for before this came out. And I remember seeing Letterboxd Friends logging them. Um, and thinking that's the thing I should get around to at some point. But now that I've seen RRR, I'm like, oh, okay, this is like a director to know mm -hmm. um, because so many of the, the things that are strong about it are like directorial choices. Um, he also has a movie called Ega, which is like about somebody coming, like being reincarnated as a fly to like get revenge on someone who killed him. That seems fun. Um, seems hella fun. But anyways, RRR is about these two real historical revolutionaries um, who helped with India's um, revolution from Britain, um, who in the historical record never actually met, but there's like a period of time, like a gap in history. We don't really know what either of them were up to. And so this movie is kind of like history fan fiction, imagining mm -hmm. what it would have been like if those two people crossed paths and like did some revolutionary shit together. Um, and it is a thing that I was surprised by fairly early on is like just how silly it treats this subject matter at times. Like it is like truly sincerely mad about imperialism and, and Britain in general, but it is um, playing with that in some of the, the most like, I don't know, goofy ways imaginable. Like, when these two guys cross paths, this is, I don't think it's a spoiler to explain like any individual thing that happens in the movie because like seeing it happen is what's crazy. Um, but like they just see each other from like across a great distance. One of them is like on a shoreline and one of them is on a bridge like over the shoreline. They like mm -hmm. lock eyes and they oh, do like a finger, they do like, like a, a quick little finger 
communication with one another. And somehow from that finger communication slash eye contact, they coordinate this entire crazy fucking rescue thing where they save a, a kid who's like drowning in a lake that has a train about to fall on him and there's flames everywhere. And what they do is like one of them is on a horse. No, is one of them on a horse? I think one of them is on a horse. The other one is on a motorcycle. Yeah, yeah, because the, like, the guy on the bridge gets on a horse, I think. Yeah. And the other they, guy gets they, on a motorcycle. One's on a horse, one's on a motorcycle. They, like, get a rope. They tie a rope to one another, and the guy on the horse jumps off the horse, off this bridge, and then the guy on the motorcycle drives his motorcycle off the bridge, and they're both, like, swinging in midair, and somehow they arranged this from the, the finger pointing. Um, <laughs> It was, and then like every time they're together, it's that like that's when the musical dance sequences are happening, and like these montages of them like training together and like riding on each other's backs and singing together and like being celebrated in, in the town square, and it's just so silly and funny. Like, um, I I can't really describe like what level of reality we're operating on here um but in the the action sequences like the way they're choreographed and the way that really everything is choreographed in this movie honestly reminded me more of anime than anything else yeah um or, or like reading a manga or something where um you know in a manga like i'm reading berserk right now which is like an action sort of like medieval high fantasy manga um and, like, you're not seeing the characters in motion, right? You're seeing, like, these specific action poses that the illustrator has put them in. And I, I feel like that is what the cinematography of this movie is like. You know, it, you're, you're getting a shot because that shot is, like, um, presenting you with, like, the most perfectly choreographed or the, the perfect angle to see this, like, highly choreographed action. Mm -hmm. Um and it's just like constantly cutting back and forth between like perfectly composed image, perfectly composed image, like in terms of the way that people's bodies are situated with one mm -hmm. another. Um, like That's it is a... so much more tightly controlled and like, it almost feels illustrated to me um, than in almost any other action movie I've seen. When you think about like more American action movies and American blockbusters, I mean they're also using a high degree of CGI in those. True, but, like, which there's a lot of CGI here too. There's an incredible amount of CGI, but yeah. it show, but it, but it like utilizes it better. It still includes like strong filmmaking techniques yeah. along with the CGI, where they're like paired together rather than using the CGI to make up for your lack of filmmaking techniques. Right, and they're using CGI here to do things that they couldn't ethically do if yeah. they were not doing cgi like um all the stuff with the animals the way they use animals in this movie is insane like um and and the moment um uh, there is a moment halfway through this movie where a lot of animals show up <laughs> all of a sudden it's and crazy. i don't i don't want to spoil the way in which these animals show up um but it is like one of the most incredible cinematic images I've seen in a long time. It was like the, the shock of all those animals being there. It puts the um, uh, the weekend's biggest movie, Jurassic World Dominion or whatever. Oh my god! Yeah, it's absolutely. a big shame. Yeah, and the fact as there's a letterbox for you that has pointed this out, but the I think it's by Scott Renshaw. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that that moment happens halfway through this movie. And then it still has another 90 minutes to continue <laughs> ramping things up. It's insane. Um, now, I do also want to, uh, like, try to dip my toe into the whole, like, is RRR political propaganda or Indian propaganda discourse from last week? You know, I'm in a similar place as you, Zach, where as an outsider, as a white dude who doesn't pay all that much attention to, like, international news, um, I, I don't know a lot about the the ways in which this movie may be carrying water for bad people politically in India. Um, but it is very apparent by the time you get to the end of this movie that like it is India, Indian propaganda. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's a whole song, the last big song in the movie is just like, here's a commercial basically <laughs> for commercial. The, it, like India as a country. Um, 
And honestly, I could have done without that number. Um, I think the movie would be like, it is a kind of a reality breaking moment in a way that the rest of the movie doesn't like the rest of the movie is still in this like cartoony reality, but near the end of the movie it, during that last sequence, it jumps into, well, now we're not in the movie space at all anymore. Now we're just kind of on a soundstage and we're singing to you, the camera about how awesome India is. And um, I could have done without that. Um, but the, I kind of got, I kind of got past it. Cause I'm like, we do that shit literally weekly in American movies. So. But what I'm thinking is like, <laughs> if in Top Gun Maverick, which I still haven't seen, there was a moment at the end where they just like stopped to thank each of the founding fathers individually for like giving us this great nation. Like that would be weird. Right. Um, and I mean, it is a I different think they context. Would like that. I don't they think they thought like that. of that. I, I think, I don't, I think they would like to do that. They haven't like, <laughs> they haven't like connected that idea yet to figure out how to do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a different context, right? Because India as a nation, as it exists now, exists that way because of like a fight against colonialism. Um, whereas like America like exists sort of because of colonialism and because of genocide. Right. So it's, it is a different thing. And like what this movie is celebrating ultimately is like revolutionary, you know, not, not liberal, but like revolutionary um, like action against an oppressive government. And so that's cool. And like, that's, that's kind of like the, the historical values that are being, um, you know, actually championed by the text of the movie. But the thing that is weird that I, I think is weird for some people, or I can imagine being weird for some people, um, is that I think the Indian government as it exists right now is a pretty right-wing government. Um, and I, I, my understanding is that like, it's kind of a theocracy, like a Hindu theocracy and that, and again, I'm, I'm kind of just basing this off of like things I've picked up through osmosis. So I'm probably wrong about some of this stuff. Someone write in and correct us if I don't actually have this right. But my understanding is that like, if you are not Hindu in India, mm -hmm. it is not a very um, welcome place for you. I think that there is like government, um, like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, persecution of people who are not Hindu. Um, and so for this movie to be just like rah rah India, our government's great. Like there are there are cool parts about American history that you could you could make movies about. But if the movie ended with like, and that's why America is perfect and has no problems, like I would think that that was weird, right? Um, so I don't know. I'm of two minds about it. Um, I think that regardless of the political, I guess this is the thing we get into again with, with King Kong of like, how do you balance like how good a movie is on a craft level with like what, you know, cultural stuff it is sort of championing. Um, but I think that even, even aside from like the political stuff, the craft and the, like just the raw action filmmaking uh, that RRR is kind of like counterbalances any of that uh, for me as somebody who's kind of like at a remove from it um, in the West. But. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I get that. And I think that, you know, it like the timing of it is strange. Um, you know, I feel like whether it's an American movie or a British movie, I mean, most other countries filter that stuff into their, you know, even you even watch like, you know, Soviet movies. Like, I mean, that's that, yeah. that, that, that kind of stuff is just all littered all in movies because movies are just this easy megaphone for propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even think propaganda is a negative thing necessarily. I think it's a neutral term. You can have propaganda for something that's really good or you have propaganda for something that's really bad. But I, I think that that is ultimately how stories work is like they propagandize certain values and ideas right yeah it, it, it's up to it's up to the the viewer the reader to be able to critically think and assess you know have the skills to kind of go oh I, you know i see what they're doing here mm -hmm. um, even if you agree with it you have i mean you know, i mean there's so many things that i agree with the overall message but mm -hmm. um you know, I have to still assess it as, I mean, this is just, it's do it's propagandizing this like, right. And I think that, um, speaking, st speaking as a journalist, we have a lot of people who are unable to discern the, the, to 
the two things. Right. Um, and it's not even just like, oh, those dummies don't. I'm like, no, it's there's people who I know are very intelligent who watch movies and don't catch stuff. Yeah. Or what's sure. going on? Because also we're not like that is not a skill that you were taught in school that like you should read movies in the same way that you like read books. Not that people actually learn to read books very well in, in school most of the time, but um, yeah, I think like in general, we do not like prioritize like investigating the meanings of the, the media that we are encountering. No. Um, I mean, I recommend it. It makes you a lot of <laughs> not fun. It makes you incredibly unfun. Um, I don't really care at this point, but, uh, but yeah, do that. It's, it's an important skill to have. Um, it's important to be unfun. Yeah. I would also, as like a last note about RRR, um, would recommend if you wanted, if you liked this movie, if, if you like many people are watching this movie, maybe it's like the first Indian movie you've seen, because I know this is a, like kind of a, a crossover hit. Um, might I recommend maybe the next night after you watch RRR, watch a uh, Dulce, um, which is also on Netflix and also is about revolutionary action against a corrupt government um, and, and deals with it in some very different and interesting ways. Um, and I think the thing that's interesting about that pairing um, is that RRR is kind of advocating for revolutionary action in the past when it's kind of easy to do that after we've already seen the positive right. effects of that. And Dilsey is kind of arguing for revolutionary action in the present, which I think is even bolder. Um, and but the movies like uh, complement each other in some great ways, I think. So, yeah. And if you if you watch that one, go back to our SRK series. We did an SRK, SRK series, yeah. Um, well, cool. From the most action packed movie of the year to the most sleepy time movie <laughs> of the year. That's right. Let's 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 uh, talk about Memoria without having to call lawyers. Yes, this is the first time I have seen Memoria. The only time I have seen Memoria for legal purposes. Um, so Memoria is um, the new movie by Pitchfong. Where Seth the Cool. We've talked about it a couple of times. I think it showed up on our year end list in 2021, though not a lot of people could see it in 2021 because of this awful. Kind of maybe maybe not that awful like roadshow distribution stupid. model that that Neon did. I think it was maybe a Pitchapong's idea initially where he wanted to have the the movie showing in one theater at a time, and just like slowly going around the globe over the course of like over a year or something. And I would have been like, "That's a great idea, man." And then been like, "Guys, we're not going to." <laughs> <laughs> I think he also maybe wanted there to be like never have it be a, a DVD release or anything. Like he just wanted the movie to exist in these spaces at this very, very slow pace because, you know, that's who a pitch phone was Seth cool is. Um, and I think that that what that eventually evolved into is like, well, certain cities are going to get it like gradually and not in the same way that like a limited release happens where like it's New York and LA and it's everywhere. But like, no, it's like, jumping from one city one week to another city another week. Um, and it is in Knoxville now. So I went to see Memoria in a theater, which is the way that you need to experience this movie. It's one, I guess that's why I'm a pitch upon was thinking like, maybe it shouldn't be a home video release because this is very much a movie that's designed for a theatrical experience, specifically because of the sound, um, mm -hmm. like a movie theater sound experience is so different from what you can get at home even if you have a really nice sound system um this movie is all built around sound um i i do have things that i want to say about like the story itself but my main takeaway is that like this is a movie kind of like portrait of a lady on fire a couple years ago um but even more pronounced here that is like inviting you to pay attention to sound in a way that you usually do not in yes movies. um like the first shot of this movie is you don't even really sure what you're looking at it's it's like a silhouette the silhouette of tilda swinton sitting in bed but we're just kind of the camera just hangs on her sleeping body for a really long time and it's like silent there's like no sound in this movie whatsoever until a big bang 
happens. Oh, this and, movie got me on some jump scares because those bangs yeah. are, are big. The, the bangs are really big. Nowhere. And you need that theater thump. Like the entire yeah. room needs to like vibrate a little bit whenever this sound happens. Um, and then like she wakes up, she goes looking for the noise. She can't find the noise. She doesn't know where it came from. And then the next shot after that first scene, this is my favorite shot of the movie. And it's one of my favorite shots of any of Pitch Bongworth Seth Cole movies. It is a shot of a parking lot and is like slowly zooming in on this parking lot that has no people in it, just cars. And one at a time, all the car alarms go off. And you eventually have like, you're looking at 20 cars, all that have their car alarms going off. And that is, you know, for for a filmmaker whose um, filmography is mostly associated with like silence and quiet, a really loud, intense experience to hear all these car alarms like blaring in your face for a while um and from that point on you're kind of like keyed into this very specific wavelength where like every sound feels like it matters um like there's a there's a scene early on where um tilda swinton's character is sitting um next to a, a hotel bed or not a hotel bed a hospital bed sorry um because her sister is in the hospital and after her sister falls asleep she Tilda Swinton just like leans back in her chair very slowly. And you hear like every individual creak <laughs> of that chair as it responds to her body as she's sitting down in it. Um, and the rest of the movie is kind of like that. Like there's a, there's a beautiful sequence where she just like uh, comes across a jazz band that's playing mm -hmm. a song and she doesn't know any of the people in the band, but she just like stops and listens to them for a whole song. And the camera stops and waits with her and you get to listen to that song. And like so much of the movie is like, man, isn't sound cool? Like, <laughs> isn't it cool? The kinds of things we can hear, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that's like the main thing that I, that I take away from it. Um, I, there is like, I think a lot of thematic stuff to unpack though. I don't, feel like I fully understand this movie, which I think that all always with the pitch of movies, I'm, I'm kind of grasping at something that's like just a couple more inches away from me. Okay. Um, but I think this one is like, you know, to, to double dip in the thematics of RRR, I think it's about colonialism on some level, like so much of it takes place in this, this urban space that almost reminds me of like Jacques Tati's playtime or something mm -hmm. that is so different than the, you know, the jungle that a Pitchapong usually spends um, his movies in. And then in like the last third, we're back in the jungle again. Um, and she's like communing with this guy who may or may not belong to this indigenous tribe that people were talking about earlier in the movie, like this tribe who doesn't want to be found. Um, and I think there's something going on here with like, people constructing a civilization on top of another civilization and kind of pretending the other one never existed. And like that older civilization kind of like um, still sort of being around as like a ghost or an echo or a haunting or something, um, which I, I think is maybe what's going on with the sound in this movie. Like Tilda Swin is like, she's getting a, um, a quick, um, I don't know, uh, hint of that and sort of following that trail where it leads her. Um, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in this movie really, uh, on a, on a thematic level other than, um, it, it really like forces a certain mindset shift and a certain like sensory experience that you're not going to get in a movie, in a movie theater, um, in, in any other context really. Yeah. Um, so it's good. People should watch it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, you know, I, I saw it in a theater at TIFF, um, and it was worth it because it was like 9 a.m. I was a little yeah. sleepy, so that was perfect mood. But then, like, it's great because you kind of lull in. You sit there and it's like, yeah. and you're like, oh, what's up? Yeah, I, I watched it very alert. And I think, like, maybe it was because I had coffee that morning or maybe it's because I was just so hype about seeing the new Pitch Pong movie in a theater that I was just, like, very, you know, engaged. <laughs> um, but I do think that, seeing one of his movies when you're like a little tired is kind of the ideal way to experience them. Oh, like he nice. wants you to sort of like drift like just over the border of sleep and back again over the course of the movie. Um, 
which can be a really cool experience. Highly recommend. Absolutely. More sleepy movies. <laughs> Big fan. Of them. Uh, well, cool. So if, if uh, you're lucky, Memoria might show up in your town because they got a stupid ass release schedule for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, just give us like a Blu-ray. Christ Almighty. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Whatever. I really hope they do at some point. Stupid sell. Whatever. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to wrap us up with uh, the latest Netflix Adam Sandler partnership that really doesn't align with some of the other Netflix Adam Sandler partnerships. Mm -hmm. That is Hustle. Um, it's directed by Jeremy Zagger, who did a movie a couple of years ago. I never saw it, but I remember seeing people talking about it. Uh, we the Animals. Um, mm -hmm. 2018, so it's been a number of years. But I remember people talking about that a little bit. It's kind of like an indie indie thing. Um, so it's not like it's not like his usual stable of like Happy Madison people, even though it's a Happy Madison production. Um, but the, the story is Adam Sandler is playing. Um, he's a former basketball player who is now a scout for the Philadelphia 76ers. And so what he does is he travels all over the world, uh, seeing players that could potentially play for the 76ers and kind of coming back with notes and, and things like that. And so at the beginning of the movie, uh, you meet, you see him kind of going through that process. Um, and he, he really can't find anybody. He finds one guy that is probably the best of the lot, but he's like, you know, he's still not really up to the task of, of what they would want as a player. Um, and so he presents that to the, the, the front office group led by the uh, owner of the 76ers played by Robert Duvall. Um, and Robert Duvall clearly is somebody who's kind of believed in him, really pushed him, wanted to get him, um, you know, kind of been somebody who's invested in his career. And then, of course, you have uh, the shit son who is just like, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And fuck you. Um, and that's played by Ben Foster, who's just kind of an asshole the entire movie. <laughs> uh, and so... Uh, you know, at the at the end of the meeting, Robert Duvall pulls Adam Sandler aside and shows him this office saying that he's going to elevate him from just being a scout so he can get off the road and he's going to make him an assistant coach. Um, and so he's all happy. He's pumped up. He tells his family. Um, his wife is played by Queen Latifah and they're all happy. But then Robert Duvall's character dies. And so uh, Ben Foster takes over over the team and so he and he puts adam sandler back into the the scout role and so he's kind of annoyed pissed off done with it but going on the road and he's in the the movie really picks up when he goes to spain and he comes across this uh this player played by a real life nba player uh one show hernan gomez um and he's just kind of like you know it's during a pickup game he's just like holy shit this guy's amazing and so he he kind of sends sends tape and sends all the stuff to the 76ers front office and Ben Foster's like, I don't know about that guy. I'm not so sure about him. <laughs> um, and so because Adam Sandler's character just like desperately believes in him, he he lies to to the, to the player and, and you know says the 76ers are going to bring him in for a tryout and all this stuff. And so he flies him back into Philadelphia and all this all these things. Um, and so then. Then the movie kind of picks up into he's going through the kind of combine circuit, showing off his, you know, showing off of other front offices to be to be drafted because by that time he has his in his first tryout it doesn't go well. He's uh, he's pretty he's bullied by uh, actual NBA player Anthony Edwards, whose name is what was his name? His name's Kermit Wiltz. And like Adam Sandler has this great line in the movie where he's like, "Are you gonna get bullied by a guy that's named after a frog?" <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I don't, honestly, the two of them are pretty good. Like they actually do a good job in acting. Juancho Hernan, Hernan, Hernan Gomez is fantastic, and Anthony Edwards in bad. He's probably they're both probably better actors than they are NBA players. Oh wow! <laughs> Shots well, fired. Well, Anthony Edwards is—he's still young, but Hernan Gomez way better actor than he is an NBA player. Wow! Um, Consider a career change, sir. Might as well. <laughs> um, but so then, so he has this first bad tryout, and then the rest of the movie is kind of him. He also kind of gets blackballed because the Ben Foster character starts leaking out all this stuff about him having a uh, domestic dispute charge and other things. 
and he, you know, he says that Adam Sandler, he fires Adam Sandler and gets, you know, kind of starts uh, uh, dragging his name through the press. And so the rest of the movie is Adam Sandler kind of coaching up this kid, working with him and getting him up to the level to potentially be um, an NBA draftee. Um, and to be honest, it's it hits a lot of pretty um, – the, the, the kind of usual beats. It's, it's not really veering from the path too much in terms of the, the beats of the story. Um, but I think where it excels is one, Adam Sandler's really, he's really good. He's really good in this role. Like, you know, I saw somebody describing it kind of like Sandler's in a similar mode to what I talked about with Tom Cruise a couple weeks ago with Top Gun Maverick, where he's just kind of, he's starting to settle into kind of old age or older age and kind of just taking on these roles that are much more different from like, Happy Gilmore, or Billy Madison, or things, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this one, I think, is just it's not up to the level of like Uncut Gems or Punch Struck Love or th- things like that. But I right. think it's just like a really good, steady performance. He's just he's he's constant. He, you know, when you need him to step up in the scene, like he comes at it. Like he's 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 really like solid the entire way through. Do you think um, that Sandler wants to be like more consistently a dramatic actor? And does the comedy things because he knows that's what pays the bills? Or do you think that this is a thing he does kind of for fun on the side? I don't know. I think, I think he, I think he does like it. I think it, I think it depends on what the project is. You know, he did uncut gems because he wanted to work with the Safties. He did punch truck love because he wanted to work with Paul Thomas Anderson. You know, Mm -hmm. if, you know, fucking Tom Hooper show calls him up, goes, Hey, Hey mate, you want to do a you want to do a movie with me? He's like he's probably not going to go for that. But like yeah. I think you know like Spanglish, he that's James L. Brooks. I think if it's somebody right. he wants to work with, he'll work with them. And it's so, wild to think about um, Adam Sandler like sitting down to watch Heaven Knows What or something. You know, like the, he wanted to work with the Safties, sought them out. That's wild to think about. Yeah, no, right? And I think they're doing another movie together. Oh really? Um, yeah, and so. Uh, but this also, I think this this was not that this one doesn't have like a big name director attached to it. He he's been a lifelong basketball person. He, you, yeah. you see him constantly into basketball. You see those elements in the uncut gems and a lot of the happy you know like Mr. Deeds and other Happy Madison pro- productions. Like he just loves basketball. And I think as like his like this is my basketball movie. I think it's kind of the perfect mix. Um, yeah. But no, I think I, I think like I said, it hits the beats that you kind of expect. It doesn't stray from the path too much. Um, but I think what it does well is it captures, this is a really good, like, basket, cinematic basketball movie. Really, really good. I mean, it's, it's you know, close to, not as good, but close to the level of something like He Got Game, where it just captures mm-hmm. the, the sport really well. Yeah. It, ha- it has this, it, the, probably the best thing in the movie that really was impressive is it has this long montage that is really well edited because it's like three different sections that could be like three different times you think this montage is going to end, but it like succinctly just edits it together in this way where it goes longer than you would think. And it goes to three different parts, but at the, but at the same time it flows together because it's just so well shot and edited um, mm-hmm. where you're watching the Juan Soto Hernan Gomez characters um, just kind of going through drills, working with Adam Sandler um, they have this really, like they use this camera angle, especially with the scenes where he's uh, facing the Anthony Edwards kind of antagonist character, where they have these kind of shot reverse shots, but while at the same time while playing basketball, mm-hmm. that and they kind of like to a degree silhouette it, so you ha- you see like their face, and then it's kind of blurred out, so it's very much you just get like this intense one on one, and so I think it helps because while Anthony Edwards is just sitting there like berating him and getting in his head. It, it adds an effect, not from what he's saying, but it just kind of creates this like almost um, like almost expressionistic effect where, or, or something like an, almost like an Ozu movie where you're wow. just watching those sh- shot reverse shots mm-hmm. and you're just getting the profile of the person and everything else is kind of backed out. Um, it's really like, there's a lot of the, a lot of filmmaking te- uh skills on display here that you know it could have just been a basic basketball movie but it does elevate it to that degree so but the guy who made it doesn't have anything else that's notable 
No, I mean, just in terms you know, we mentioned like Paul Thomas Anderson and James L. Brooks and people. Yeah. Like he doesn't have the name recognition of those two, but I hope that he kind of gets some more shots because again, like this is, it's, it's incredibly well-directed. It's, it's much more well-directed than really the story. It has any business from the story. Yeah. Because again, the story's pretty basic. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, you know, it's still a pretty funny movie. It has this wonderful, I like it because the, the player plays for the Mavericks. So I just kind of love seeing him, but it has this hilarious scene at the beginning with, uh, with the, the, uh, the, 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 the basketball player named Boban, um, who's like seven foot three is just, this like freakishly tall. He's actually, if you've seen John wick three, he's the guy that fights John wick in the beginning <laughs> because he's just like super freakishly tall. Right. But he's also the most lovable guy of all time. He's just he's super he's just like a total <laughs> sweetheart. Um, but he he's like one of the players that Adam Sandler is trying to recruit. And he's this, you know, seven three uh Serbian player. And Adam Sandler's like, Well, how old are you? And he's like, I'm twenty two. And he's just kind of <laughs> looking at him. And then like this this like eighteen year old kid, his eighteen to twenty year old kid walks out and he's like, Who's that? And he goes, Oh, that's my son. He's like, Well, how old's he? And he's like, He's ten. <laughs> he has like a he has kind of like a five o'clock shadow beard. It's like it's just such a, it's such a like just a, like a silly moment that you get some of those where you kind of get that dissonance between like this is an NBA player and this is not a, you know like an right. NBA player. Um, but no, I think uh, I th- I think it's worth checking out. I think it it has you know it does it's doing more than what you would expect from. Uh, a lot of the the Netflix Adam Sandler movies, and I think that he does give a really a really strong performance in it that kind of shows that I hope that I hope that the Meyerowitz stories and this movie and some of the you know some of the, his other recent kind of more laid back movies mm-hmm. are um, are kind of the direction he's going. It also reminded me a lot of a very underrated movie from. I think two years ago, the way back with an athlete. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is also a good basketball movie, and also just a strong. It's just kind of one of those like middle middle of the road movies with a strong lead performance from a star that like mm-hmm. it's just kind of it's it's it, those things are just getting lost in streaming. And they're still good and they're still around, but they're just kind of getting lost in the shuffle because right. it doesn't have like the firepower of. Um, you know, the blockbuster stuff that Netflix is put, putting out or it's then they're not going to take that risk to put it in the movie theater. Like I would have loved to see mm. this in the movie theater because it has those cheesy moments where you're like, I know what's going to happen here, but I'm also just really excited for these, for these characters. Who, right. So kind of hit that moment. So I, I know that awesome. um, Adam Sandler signed a deal with Netflix at some point where it was like a 10 movie deal or something. Do you know if he's still in that deal or is this just kind of like a rolling thing that he has with Netflix? They just put out whatever he wants to do now. I think to a degree it's a role. It's a, I mean, I'm just going to look at his movies and see. Cause I know that they made that deal because Adam Sandler movies are actually getting more clicks than anything else on Netflix. So oh, like, sure. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's just make that our brand. So let's see. I think he started it with maybe the Ridiculous Six. Yeah. So Ridiculous Six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this would be the seventh one. Okay. Three more Netflix Adam Sandler joints to come. At least. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing he he did that movie Murder Mystery with uh, Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. It looks like mm-hmm. that's getting a sequel. Oh, he's also produced a bunch. I'm looking because he produced a couple like <clears throat> of the stuff that like Kevin James and uh, David mm-hmm. Spade have done as well. But you know, as another side note, I was googling the Safdie brothers because you mentioned Adam Sandler working with the Safties again. And another thing they're working on is very exciting to me. They're doing a series for Showtime with Nathan Fielder um, that is like yeah. a parody of HGTV house flipping shows. And doesn't it sound amazing? Nathan Fielder is like a house flipper who <laughs> buys a house that's cursed. <laughs> I can't wait. Honestly, honestly, sign me the hell up. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Um, I don't know what the Safety brothers are bringing to that, but I'm curious to see. 
Yeah, honestly, Nathan Fielder could probably just handle it himself. He could yeah, do it himself. Yeah. Whatever. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think if you're looking for kind of just a low key, nice hour, I think it, I think it was two hours. It probably could have been cut down a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of low key, nice little drama. Like I said, I think Adam Sandler was really good. Though. So Sweet. hustle. It's on Netflix. Hustle. Um, all right, we're gonna take a quick break, and then we we will be back talking King Kong after this. I'm going to go to the bathroom. BRB. What is going on, YouTube viewers? This episode of Cinematary brought to you by PBR. PBR, please sponsor us because then we can have more PBRs. It's the working man's beer. The working man's beer. All right, guys, let's see what the Ranger scores. Comment below if you can guess what the Ranger scores right now. Anybody? Dun, 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 dun. It's zero, zero. But they rallied yesterday and beat the Astros, who are cheaters. And so that's a, that's a big one for you. That's a big one, you know? Those walking people, that's annoying. Does anybody use LinkedIn? It's stupid. That's all I got. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I'm stopping. I'm stopping. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. No. You know, on the count of three, tell us what movies you want us to watch next. One, two, three. So I didn't hear anybody, so let's see that. We're going to watch whatever. By the way, if anybody's curious, still strong. Let's let's start a let's start a group, a cemetery group of people who believe that the queen is dead. Taking taking names now. Queen is dead. Dot cemetery. Dot com. Dun, 
Queen is dead subreddit. Where we talk about how the queen is dead. I think we should, you know, let's always let's have some nice. It's always nice to have some like fun, harmless conspiracy theories, you know, keep life fresh. There's Andrew vacuuming. Rising. Something in Redstone or whatever. This is I just sometimes wish it'd be nice um, to have good movies. Me too. Me too. And that's the end of the conversation, everybody. <laughs> you have to go watch that one. We're going to start a, a, a subreddit that, called the Queen is Dead, cinematary.com. Okay. Into it. And then I asked them, and then we guessed what the Ranger score was, but nobody answered, so I just gave it to them. <laughs> and then I asked for the audience to tell us what movies we wanted to we wanted. You know, they wanted us to watch, and then we mm -hmm. answered, so I'm just like, we're going to watch whatever. I guess we're going to talk about King Kong. Yeah, so. Democracy's dead, guys. <laughs> All right. I got a lot of, a lot of, like. I bet the fact sheet is long for this one. I had to kind of just pick and choose. There's, like, there was so much shit. Yeah. Probably one of the most written about movies we've done. Yeah, I just tried to stick to. Just uh, this is a Patreon exclusive, YouTube exclusive. I'll say it again in the podcast, but we're just gonna have to work through some of these quotes. Mm. It's not Zach making these quotes. Zach mm. is reading quotes being made. Mm. So, and, and and Zach didn't Zach's write. not gonna have to say any slurs, is he? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. But it's more like it's yeah. You know, there's there's an implication. There's right. a whole section about, you know, exotic animals that definitely tread some lines. So let's just warning I'm tag. This was not written it. by Zach. Mm -hmm. These are just stuff. This is stuff pulled from really the American Film Institute. Mm -hmm. So that's on them. So well, let's jump into it so you can give that warning again. All right. That's just YouTube exclusive. They're so tired of me. I've been talking for five minutes. All right. Uh here we go. In three, two, one. And we are back. Oh, on. Oh. oh, are we? Do you need to start over? Yeah, my. Let me see. Okay. All right. In three. Two, wait, 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 wait. Okay, now I'm ready. Okay. In three, two, one. 
And we're back with part two of episode 408 of Cinematary. In this part, we're going to be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series with 1933's King Kong, which I think we've had for a couple of years now. So good to Yeah, find it's, it it's almost always on the ballot, but um, finally, this finally is good to get it. You're so, the monkey. Is it? I don't know. Let me look it up. Okay. You just let's just fact check that while I'm working through these notes. All right, just a warning. Some of the stuff you're gonna like be listening and, be, and kind of be like, eh, eh, what, eh, "What are they talking about?" Remember, Zach didn't write this. The American <laughs> Film Institute wrote it, and their quotes from you know at, at most like 50 years ago, but farther back. So. We're just going to have that warning label. And so mm-hmm. don't be coming at me saying, well, th- no, I didn't write it. That's just, we're talking about a movie from mm-hmm. 1933. And we'll get into into reasons why it might have these different, these these uh, these eclectic mm-hmm. views while we get into the discussion. Anyway, all right. It's the year of the tiger, by the way. Is this the, uh, is this the most like touchy movie that we have talked about since Birth of a Nation? It's not to that level. I was thinking it's about that. It's not to that level, but I'm wondering was, if there's anything that competes in the cinematary catalog. No. I was thinking about that actually, and I was like, this movie's got its problems, but it's not as like explicitly it's yeah. not it's not like reveling in like just kind of just simmering in racism like Birth of a Nation is. It's it's you have to interpret it to get the racist stuff. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah. it's, it's definitely like kind of you know touching it a few times, but it's not yeah. like like Birth of a Nation just simmers in it. It's mm-hmm. just racism. Anyway, <laughs> um, King Kong, it's directed by Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Shotzak, which is a great name. Um, from a script by James Creelman and Ruth Rose, the film stars Faye Ray, Robert uh, Armstrong, Bruce Cabot, and Frank Riker. The working titles of the film was the Eighth Wonder. Uh, the Eighth Wonder, The Beast, and Kong. Um, honestly, you know, you can laugh at Kong, but they literally made that a title eventually. So, <laughs> um, According to a modern interview with Marion C. Cooper, the creation of King Kong began with him. In 1929, Cooper, who, uh, who with co-director Ernest Shodstack, had made two successful ethnographic documentaries, Grass in 1925, in Chang in 1927. He started writing a long monograph on baboons based on observations he had made of the animals while location shooting in Africa for Paramount's The Four Feathers, a drama he made with David Oselznik, Shodzak, and Fay Ray. Although the monograph was accidentally destroyed, never rewritten, Cooper <laughs> re, uh, retained his interest in exotic animals and read The Dragon Lizards of Komodo a nonfiction book written by his friend W. Douglas Burden, a trustee of the American Museum of Natural History in New York. In his book, Burden describes his exploration of of the East Indian island of Komodo and his study of the rare dragon lizards that inhabit the island, Komodo dragons. Um, In a letter to Burden written in 1964 and quoted in a modern source, Cooper says, then, quote, then one day after one of my conversations with you, I thought to myself, why not film my gorilla? I also had it very firmly in mind. <laughs> well, these are questions I ask myself all the time. Why don't I just film my gorilla? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like he's talking about like his dick or something. <laughs> um, uh, I also had very firmly in mind to giant ties, giant ties. That's what it says. Both the gorilla and your dragons to make them really huge. However, I always believed in personalizing and focusing attention on one main character. From the very beginning, I intended to make it the gigantic gorilla, no matter what else I surrounded him with. I had already established him in my mind on a prehistoric island with prehistoric monsters, and I now thought of having him destroyed by the most sophisticated thing I could think of in civilization. My very own concept was to place him on top of the Empire State Building and have him killed by airplanes. I thought that by the... uh, I thought that by mats and double printing and the new technique called rear projection, it could be done. I personally conceived and and initiated development of the photographic process afterwards called miniature projection. I went ahead and wrote a number of outlines of King Kong in the years 1929 and 1930. In a return letter, Byrd confirms many of his recollections, including that he wanted to 
Why not film my gorilla? Um, after Cooper visited the set of Creation, a stop action, stop motion uh, action and animated film on which uh, Chief Technician Willis H. O'Brien and his crew had been working for over a year, he concluded that the project should be scrapped, but that O'Brien's stop action animation techniques, which O'Brien first developed in a 1925 first national film, The Lost World, should be used to realize his own giant gorilla idea. Um, Cooper realized that by using O'Brien's techniques, Kong could be made without costly location shooting in Africa. And in a uh, December 19th, 1931 studio report, uh, Cooper writes, quote, I have prepared and am sending my concept of this giant terror gorilla and the kind of scenes in which he should be used. However, before any large amount of money is spent on this picture, I suggest that we make two scenes with a giant gorilla to see how lifelike and terrible a character can make. it can be made. Um, a contemporary New York Times article reported that, quote, three months were spent investigating specific, uh, scientific records before a single scene was photographed on the RKO radio sets. Geographical data concerning the vegetation, location, and population of an Amer imaginary island were checked with experts in U uh, university research departments. Paleontologists were consulted by Willis O'Brien. It was discovered that the most likely place for an island where prehistoric monsters might exist was off the Malay Peninsula. Uh, the backgrounds were prepared with this locale in mind. More than 600 hand drawings with quantities of detail were made by the scientific artists Mario Laranaga uh, and uh, Byron Crabb. Ernest Smythe also drew some of the illustrations. And I just included this because this name is absurd. Edward Mewbridge, in his 19th century sequence of photographs of animals in motion, as well as slow motion films of ele elephants, were also studied by the animators. According to another New York Times article, the, quote, initial work of the technical staff was kept secret from the general staff on the lot because R RKO wanted to be certain the secrecy of its process was kept in vault, uh, in I just like, I just got to go back. I like that uh, that they had to find the most likely made up island i like that <laughs> um the model of kong was built around an articulated seal skeleton and had latex rubber muscles which moved in a lifelike manner the skeleton was stuffed with cotton covered with uh covered with uh with fur like covered with la liquid latex to form the basic shape and then covered with bear fur originally well, there it was it was like um it wasn't lifelike, but I think it was pretty big. I think it would, you know, probably not that, like if it was standing here, it probably It'd probably be different. almost the size of a person. Yeah, it was like, it was okay. like, it was decent sized. Gotcha. Um, originally rabbit fur was used, but was replaced after the anim animators discovered that it held and revealed their finger impressions from shot to shot. Because the model suffered wear and tear over the course of shooting, two Kong miniatures were constructed and spelled each other as needed. The miniature dinosaurs had their own stand-ins, simply constructed models that were used when a set was being uh, lighted. In her autobiography, Faye Ray describes how the, quote, big arm sequences were shot. Quote, the big arm, about six feet long, was attached to a lever so it could be raised and lowered. I would stand on the floor while I gripped, would place uh, the flexible fingers around my waist, and it gripped uh, secure enough to uh, allow me to be raised to a level in line with an elevated camera. There were, was a wind machine to give motion to my clothes, and I struggled to give the illusion that Kong, uh, that Kong was a fearsome 40 uh, feet tall. Uh, Joel McRae was first considered for the role of Jack Driscoll, but Bruce Man. Cabot was hired because he was perceived as better suited to the physical demands of the part. Mm, um, no, I disagree. Oh, wish, yeah. Joel McRae, got him. Yeah. Put Joel McRae in whatever movie you want. Yeah. Uh -huh. In 1933, The Hollywood Reporter said, Picture to yourself a beast larger than the largest you have ever seen, even in books, falling in love with a beautiful girl. In protecting, your, in protecting her, he literally wrecks the animal kingdom in which he lives. He kills first one monster, then another, and another. He destroys practically an entire tribe of cannibals. Finally, he is captured and brought to New York for exhibition. He escapes, throws the city into panic, scales high buildings, wrecks subways, always in search of or believing he is protecting the girl. If you can picture these things in your mind, you have a faint idea of King Kong. Um, I do approve of the choice to use a phony 1930s radio announcer voice when quoting all these things. Uh, makes it harder for people to clip you out of context, I suppose. There you go. And in 1933, Variety said, while not believing it, while not believing it, audiences will wonder how it's done. 
If they wonder, they'll talk. And that talk plus the curiosity of the advertising should incite ought to draw business all over. Tongue mystifies as well as it horrifies and may open up a new medium for scaring babies via the screen. <laughs> That's what's important. We need a new way to scare babies. <laughs> Somebody got paid to write that. Oh my god. All right. Uh, had you seen King Kong before? No, I never have. What did you? What, I'd, I'd seen it once before um, in a theater. So what, what did you make of it? Well, what I make of it varies wildly based on what part of the movie we're talking about. Because um, there's basically like four parts of the movie. There's the part of the movie before we meet King Kong. There's the part of the movie where King Kong fights dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, there's a very small part of the movie where um, we're getting ready for a show. We're going to show King Kong off to New Yorkers. And then there's the Empire State Building showdown. Part. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like that second chunk. And I kind of like the third chunk too about like the show part of it. Yeah. Um, but like the thing that's cool about the second chunk, Kong V Dinosaurs, um, really has nothing to do with the first chunk of the movie, which I think we'll probably both agree is like pretty awful, right? Oh, like, like the, the part of them like kind of like him finding the actress and then going to the island. Yeah. Just like the whole yeah, it's, it's super, framing, it's like the narrative conceit as to why we're on the island where Kong is in the first place. It's just kind of awful. And like both in terms of it's kind of boring mm-hmm. and it's like really sexist and really racist. Um, and it just, it's like kind of frustrating that like that is the narrative frame of the movie because like, you can make a movie where a big monkey fights a big dinosaur and it doesn't have to be about any of that shit. You know, like, listening to you, given the, uh, the fact sheet about this movie, hearing like the behind the scenes story, it seems like what they mainly wanted to do is to tell a story about a big monkey. You know, like <laughs> they, all, they, they just wanted Cooper to one see a big monkey. monkey fight shit, you know, and like <laughs> yeah, the, the historical record has shown you can make plenty of different kinds of movies about big monkeys fighting shit. Um, but this Jurassic this, World in theaters, <laughs> that's right. Um, but this particular movie, um, who oh boy, it is like just kind of inviting you to read it in the, the worst way possible. Um, I mean, we should, we should talk about the sexist stuff and then we can get into the racist stuff because that's kind of like how the movie, uh, presents itself. Are we going to gonna start there and then get to the, like the actual craft of the movie or what's, what's, what's the order? We're doing? I don't know. What are your thoughts on King Kong in general? You've seen it before, right? Yeah. I saw it once in a movie theater, which kind of made it a little bit more fun just because you have, you know, as you described, big monkey fighting things. Yeah. Um, hella fun on a big screen. Right. Um, I definitely, you definitely recognize it. it's deeply blatant. The, uh, the sexism and, in, in racism the racism i think is uh a little bit more implicit it's more implicit the sexism this and the sexism checks with a lot of if you watch similar um kind of like blockbuster like big like big show movies of this Mm -hmm. era you're gonna run into that shit the interesting thing and this can kind of lead us into the sexism discussion Mm -hmm. is i think i'm not condoning the sexism (laughs) but (laughs) but but I think it there is like a like an interesting parallel between you. So here's the kind of here's the kind of scene that unlocked it a little bit. Um, okay. You have that sequence before they get to the island where the the what's his what's his face Jack? Is it Jack? Who's the director? I don't know. I call him the director. Oh no, it's um, Carl. Carl uh, Denim. They call him, uh, they kept calling Denim. Calling him Denim. Um, so, uh, Denim is like directing the Fay Ray character, um, on like how to react for this thing. And he's like sitting there, like rolling the camera and just shouting like mm-hmm. different commands at her. And she's kind of just reacting to it. Um, and you even have like the, the, the sailors kind of like making, like going like, well, what, like, 
the hell is she doing? What do they, they expect to be out there that she has to like act like this? And so like the way you kind of see him kind of con- like prop her up and construct her um, and really just kind of pluck her out of the environment she was in. I think you kind of like that. I think that creates a deeper connection to a degree with the Kong character because Kong gets plucked out of his environment and then they just kind of doll him up and show him off. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they're again, like not to condone the sexism, but like they're like, it's to a degree, I found it to be there. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if this is intentional, but it was, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on like to what extent we are supposed to, um, find the director's behavior in this movie kind of like questionable right like and i don't i don't don't think they really prop him up to be like oh yeah this is a great guy like i don't think he is propped up as a great guy but i it feels like he's maybe just like an author avatar or something like it's it's a director who wants to show the world a grand spectacle like they've never seen before which is what this movie is Right. I yeah, think but it's like it's a movie about the making of this movie, sort of. Yeah, but he's also you you get it in, in comments like when they get back to New York and other places. He's also kind of this like he makes a bunch of shit. He's he he seems to yeah. constantly be kind of working in this mode. And he and he kind of has like this grifter vibe. Like he's just constantly kind of just like oh, doing yeah. what he needs to do. And so that's why I say I don't think they really present him as like, oh, this is the guy you need you want mm-hmm. to be. And so I think that to, to me, it's kind of interesting, like his treatment and how he's kind of propping up the, the and Darrow, the Faye Ray character mm-hmm. compared to what he does with Kong later on, where he just kind of has him, yeah. he strips him out of the environment and props him up to be the spectacle for people. Yeah. Jesse was kind of like wandering in and out of the room while I was watching this movie. And one part that she was there for was um, it was the, the third chunk of the movie as I'm labeling it where they're back in New York and there are reporters that are talking to the director and Faye Ray's character and asking them about um, their adventure uh, out to this Island where the monkey was found. Um, And like, he is going on and on and on about this like horribly scary thing that happened to her. And she's Mm -hmm. not really saying much of anything. And Jesse's like, this is probably fun for her to like relive the worst day of her life over and over for like, you know, excited tabloid journalists. Uh, yeah. Like, let me just like, you know, tell you about my trauma, uh, you know? And, but the way the movie is shot um, and framed, like does not really encourage you to think that anything that is happening here is tragic, right? This is just like, this is what's happening. You know, journalists are talking to her um, and like, we're not really encouraging the audience to view, to think about that in one particular way or another, you know, like mm-hmm. it's very, flat in terms of the way that the story is actually told to us. It, the only time the movie feels flashy in any way um, is when there's a giant monkey fighting stuff. No, that's, and that's, that's why like, I think if the movie, and that's why I say there's not much, I don't find this to be really the intention because yeah. I think if it really wanted to intend it, it would have given much more moments to Faye Ray and the Anne Darrow character just to kind of explore how she's right. she's kind of just sidelined and again, just kind of like uh, being dragged along for the ride. And that's why I say again, I like this is this is me kind of interpreting the movie, but, to, right. but I, I do think that there's this kind of interesting parallel between her treatment, not only going to the island and on the island, but even after it, she's just kind of, again, she's just thrown out there to be a part of the show mm-hmm. to how they're treating the Kong character and kind of going, we're just going to parade him around and make him do a few tricks. Mm-hmm. And this is going to be the rest of his life. Here's a question um, that's related to the Fay Ray character. Why do you think that there's these two male leads? Like we have Carl Denham, the director, and then we have Jack Driscoll, the love interest. And it feels like maybe in an earlier version of the script, those were the same person because Jack Driscoll, the love interest is like a complete non-entity in this movie. Like he's only there for there to be a love interest. Right. Um, yeah. I think also you kind of have like a, like a, a good and bad type. Cause I mean, like, I, like we said, like I wouldn't, we wouldn't describe the, the denim character, the director as like a, this is the this is the 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 
person you want to latch on to as like the yeah. good character of the movie. So they add the Jack character to kind of be more of the the moral core. Um, because he's the one kind of going like <laughs> but isn't gotta... he the guy who's like complaining about women constantly in the first chunk of the movie and like he tells her he loves her and she's like, But Jack, you hate women. <laughs> and he says, But you're not women. And she has this like, you know, fluttery uh look on her face. Oh, shut up. Like, I'm not yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's our moral core. That's the moral center of this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, that's again. That's, I'm just kind of. That's my. That's mm. my. That's my assumption of yeah. why he's there. Well, I appreciate the attempt to uh, to find a subversive reading of King Kong. I don't know that I buy it completely, but um, it is true that, like, I guess the way we're supposed to view the director is more ambiguous than I was giving it credit for. I, I mean, I, I'm just saying. I don't think it's like we like we open like going like how does this compare to being problematic compared yeah. to like Birth of a Nation? I'm like it's nowhere near that. No, um, no, no, I think it's more in line with just how 1930s American movies were were like. That's just you know that's you know that, that's just kind of the line. That's well, the line I mean, I've seen a lot of 19, the, I've seen a lot of 1930s movies, and like most of them don't really address racism. But most of them don't necessarily remind me of racism either, right? Um, and this movie is like feels like it is actively doing it. Like it is showing me, you know, this this tribal people um, in a way that is like meant to be as dehumanizing as possible, and then oh, presenting yeah. this this gorilla character as almost like the um, uh, the ultimate version of these people or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. It's gross to think about. Um, oh, no, it's awful. And, and like, specifically, this is not like rocket science, you know, critical analysis here. I think this has been said a billion times, but, you know, specifically presenting, like, white womanhood as the thing that, like, drives the, you know, the African beast wild, Um is uh you know deeply deeply problematic for you know a lot of the same reasons that birth of the nation is problematic right like mm -hmm. it is about the the black black male raping of white women um which was you know used as like the threat of that or the imagined fear of that was the used as justification for the ku klux klan and you know like the people who killed emmett till and stuff like that you know mm -hmm. i i i'm never not thinking about that whenever King Kong is like grabbing Fay Ray's character out of a bed, <laughs> you know, like he's, he reaches his hand through the hotel window and grabs her in her nightgown out of a bed. Um, it's also a pretty gruesome movie because it, it like, is the yeah. way he, you know, like it reminds me of how they've talked a little bit about the recent Jurassic Park mo or movies by Colin Trevorrow, where like mm. there's just random characters who will just be brutally killed. Yeah. Like the, the the big example is in the first one, the Jurassic World movie. You have this kind of like she's like an she's assistant like a or something. Assistant. Yeah. yeah. And, and like she's supposed to be kind of annoying, but then they like they have a pterodactyl like pick her up and like fling her around and then like throw her into yeah. the water, and then this giant thing goes, Oh, and you're like, <laughs> what the fuck did she deserve that for? Yeah. Um, and like and like you think of this movie. One, like, when Kong's just, like, in the jungle, he, like, starts, like, taking out things. But then, like, when he's in New York, yeah, he, there's the one lady who he just, like, goes in there and grabs and just tosses out of the building. Yeah. And you're just like, Jesus Christ. I mean, the 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 victim of Kong that I feel the worst for is the T-Rex. Like, he gets it rough. Kong, he like, does headlocks him, and, I like that. and then, like, grabs both, so, like, both halves of his mouth. And like mm. twists his jaw <laughs> sideways, and he just like is still alive there, just like bleeding from his mouth, but can't move anymore. Yeah. That's pretty rough. I he does while he's in New York eat a bunch of rich people, and I approve mm. that. There's there's just like rich assholes and tuxedos. He eats them. I'm on. Yeah, I, I thought that the like rich people go into the theater banter in the third part of the movie was pretty funny. Like half of them don't even know what they're showing up for. 
I like the guy who was like, I paid twenty dollars for this. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. like, as, like as if he's just said, like, I paid ten thousand dollars for this. I'm like, right. Months? Hell yeah. You can go see a giant you know, giant gorilla. Marion Cooper would poop his pants for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Yeah, no, I mean, there ain't, there ain't, there's really no defending on the on the <laughs> like, like how the portrayal of the tribe. That's, that's yeah, that's the main thing I was alluding to last week was like, no, it, it's not great. Yeah, because there's again, like if you we're talking about like how people how people are killed in this movie, for for the most part, um, I want to do a quick aside though. When people are killed, they like switch them from being like humans. Oh, they're, they're like dummies. Ways. Yeah, awesome. Anyway, <laughs> but um, but uh, no, there's definitely like when the when the first search party or whatever is getting killed, like they're getting thrown places, they're getting chomped a little bit. There's a different nature with how Kong, whenever he breaks through the gate and starts attacking the the tribe there, mm -hmm. like he there's like one where he just like pummels this person. Yeah, there's one where he just kind of like bites, almost bites him in half. Like it's just like there is just kind of this gruesomeness, and there there's definitely this level of um, of like secondary or even third um, mm -hmm. on the scale level of like. This is who I care about in this. Yeah, you know, in this movie is like from the from the production side because the treatment of the of the tribe characters are just like they're just these podunk, you know. Well, it's this like horrifying like, mass of people, like the a threat. You know, um, you never see. I don't think there's a single shot of just like one tribesman. You never see them alone. It's always like the crowd that could, you know swarm and overtake us um yeah and they're never given like a a moment to kind of speak for no. themselves they're always speaking in like this kind of mumbo like it is very America. funny to me that the skipper on the ship just uh, happens to know oh i know that language yeah oh yeah they sound kind of like that other tribe on that other island yeah let me just like bust that out real quick it's like a less fun version of the the scene in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean three, where he's like shipwrecked on the, on that Island. He like becomes the chief of this like mm. native tribe. And he's just yes. like babbling nonsense. That or one's a up at treasure Island where yeah. Piggy becomes the, the leader of, of some indigenous tribe. Yeah. King Kong could never. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well, do you want to talk about the actual stop motion stuff? Cause that's, what's cool about this movie. And that's the thing, like, so I, I do, I, like, this movie, there's so many elements of it that aren't great, but the, the, the technical craft of it, like, the special effects are insane. Like, it's mm -hmm. incredible that this, like, a movie from 1933 looks like this. Um, yeah. I mean, like, like I was, like, I was talking about the way that they're, and even they do it with Faye Ray, where, like, she'll be, you'll catch, you'll get cut from a scene of, like, her on the ground or being held, and then it'll cut, and you'll see kind of, like, not even a dummy, but like a stop motion figure in the in Kong's hand, and right. it's just like that. The, really, to me, not even just the animation itself, but the tra the ability to transition from live action to stop motion to a stop motion thing, just so seamlessly. Um, yeah. It's very. It feels very modern, just from how it kind of transitions characters from being on the ground human to kind of stop motion characters that he's using. Mm -hmm. I would just very quickly googled when the Ray Harryhausen movies came out, Jason, the Argonauts and Clash of the Titans being the two most popular. And I, man, I thought there was so much earlier. Jason, the Argonauts came out in 1963. Yeah. I was going to say that those were, those so, were all off. Like it is just amazing to see how sophisticated the, they were able to make the stop motion in the thirties. Um, yeah. Cause like, I'm we're going to talk about, is it next week? You guys are talking about tale of the Fox. Yeah. Um, that looks really shoddy compared to this. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I guess it's like big Hollywood budget, but, you know, animators and, 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 you know, craft people had to spend a lot of time and effort and like ingenuity to make this look as convincing as it does, which is pretty convincing. Yeah. Again, like all, all everything aside, like just the, the craft level, like the, like the people like the Willis O'Brien and his team, who's like creating yeah. that animation, like they deserve, if any, if anything's getting credit in this thing, it should be them because they, they really do make it like if, if 
so back to our original point, if they just wanted to make giant monkey fights things, yeah, like, you should have just let him and his team just kind of make it, and it would have been a super fun movie. Mm-hmm. It looks better than um, the the stop motion stuff in Godzilla, the fifty four Godzilla, I mm-hmm. think, uh, and that's a better movie. I yeah, think. Um, it has like an emotional core. <laughs> um, yeah. And I didn't. I didn't get to, just because there's the, there's so many things we could be getting into with this movie because there's just a yeah. laundry list of different just facts. But it is like it, I would I would recommend listeners and, and people watching to um, just kind of just do some research on just the process of that side of things because the, again the way that they constructed that and were able to seamlessly work it into um, into the live action sections just even just like two characters kind of in the foreground and then and like the stop motion animation in the background of like a dinosaur or kong or something like that Well, there's this shot of all the men like balancing on this log and kong in the background like shaking one end of the log and like Mm -hmm. knocking them off the log into this big ravine like i really am not totally sure how they did that you know i guess i guess they shot just the, Kong moving his hands around the rear projection, and then, and then just a shot of the log being like moved by an animatronic or something like that. Yeah, um, but it that. looks really good. No, and that's what and that's what's so impressive because today it'd be a very easy, you know, it's like yeah. what they do with Jurassic World movies. It's there's you know they're acting against a tennis ball or something. Yeah, on a green screen, but no, like this one they were using rear projection. It was really like the whole technique was fascinating um you know Faye ray talks extensively about her experience because she's having to do probably the bulk of the acting up against mm-hmm. the, the kong uh figure and it's just even more than like chris pratt in jurassic world like she's right. really having to act against nothing um it reminds me of, like thinking about how they must have made this and what kinds of things we end up seeing on screen reminds me of like any movie where you have a character playing or an actor playing two roles a lot of times the way they do it is they split screen it and you can kind of tell, you know, this character played by the actor is on one side of the screen and this character played by the actress on the other side of the screen. You can see where the split happens. And there, there's a lot of times in this movie where you can kind of tell that too. Like um, there's a, there's a shot where all the tribesmen are like up on this ledge and you see Kong beneath them. So, okay, we can split this frame in half. And like the bottom half is like one composite image and the top half is another composite image. But there are a lot of moments where like the log scene and like any moment where like Faye Ray is like in the gorilla's hand, mm-hmm. um, where that is not the case, where they're like kind of um, stacking um, these images on top of each other in some pretty creative ways. No, there's a really incredible sequence where I think – I forgot Kong's just like he can it's when she's just strictly with Kong and um, she, you, you cut from like the, the big hand that they shot to put her in. You cut yeah. from like that to him putting her down and she's like kind of moving around as a human. And then he picks her up again and it goes to her as like a stop motion character all within the span of like 30 seconds. And you're just like, yeah. holy shit. Like, a lot that's of moves awesome. being made. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, just the editing side of things was just incredible. Um, mm-hmm. And so the, and even, and even, I mean, just the whole, I'll admit the whole spectacle of that final sequence when he's on top of that empire state building. Mm-hmm. One, I didn't recognize like how just kind of, tragic it was you know yeah like the, like the animation of i mean you see like like you see like bullet holes like cuts that he's getting you can then in the way that they're able to animate the the kong mm-hmm. the kind of, you, you, like you can feel it um that whole sequence is amazing like it's just an like, like yeah. incredible incredible sequence it's the image of kong on the empire state building is of course an image that i've seen a million times just because like pop culture it's everywhere um I never really understood like why he's up there though, because it seems like a bad place to be in terms of like, you're putting a giant target on yourself. Right. But thinking, watching it in context and thinking about like the psychology of a character of Kong, like to the extent that we get any psychology from him, you know, he's trying to find like high ground to be like the King of the jungle. Right. When we Mm -hmm. see him in his home, he's up on top of a mountain where he like doesn't have to deal with any predators except for like the pterodactyl that comes by for a second. He just like quickly like rips its wings apart or whatever. Um, 
and he's not ready for like what the modern world has uh, to to fight him with, right? Yeah. So it is tragic to think about this um, figure who is just like plucked out a completely different world and doesn't like it just doesn't fit here. Like that is out of place and is just like scared, basically. Yeah, I got I got more into the kind of Kong portrayal and like the the animation work that that that, that Willis O'Brien and his team did. Just yeah, because. You are like there's an amazing amount of sympathy that you're able to glean out of that character, mm -hmm. and it's completely it's completely because of the way they animated. I mean, just yeah. uh, describing that. I mean, you can see him just. He has a very of, expressive face. He's very expressive, and so like just that, and that's why I'm like, just like that that performance alone through the animators is is really impactful. You know, you can kind of laugh at a, a number of the other performances in this movie. Um, but that one's like that one's the one that actually is like technically proficient because mm -hmm. you you're not it's not like you're he's gonna be able to talk it's not like you're gonna be able to really do much but they do way more than you would expect with just a you know kind of skeletal figure that has fur on it that you're supposed to move yeah. around um and especially again like i'll re reiterate that last scene like when he's just getting shot he's like up there just kind of trying to do his best and getting mm -hmm. shot by these airplanes and like I don't know. You feel bad for you. It's like, I mean, he just wanted to live on his and island and you, fight his... We're kind of like up there with him for a pretty long time while he's mm -hmm. just kind of being pelted by, you know, bullet after bullet. Like, he doesn't fall immediately. It's several waves of the planes coming and eventually knocking him down to kind of like really uh, dwell on that for a little and bit. And I, I, haven't, I haven't seen the Peter Jackson one. I've seen parts of it and it's been a long time, but I think that it <sighs> tries to kind of... It, it, it kind of tries to tap more into like that I think no, no, the pathos. Um, yeah, I think Naomi Watts is the female lead. I don't remember. I remember Jack Black is in it. <laughs> Jack Black is in it, but yeah. uh, I think it's Naomi Watts who's the female lead, and like they they really try to play up that whole the the, the kind of dynamic I'm describing between her and the and the Kong. Um, the thing about that movie is it's 187 minutes. It's a long. And I, I watched it when I was yes, like no. thirteen. I'm I'm pretty sure based on the year it came out. Interesting. And, uh, so, thought it was boring. That's interesting. So Jack Black is the denim character. Yeah, so he's the director, and then Adrian Brody is the Jack Driscoll character. Mm. Naomi Watts is Andero. Huh. I I kind of want to watch it. Watch it. I mean, Peter I Jackson is a blockbuster craftsman when he wants to be, right? Yeah. And I, I would just be curious on how they on how they handle things. Compared. Yeah, I would be curious to hear secondhand from you. I don't want to watch it myself, but <laughs> please let me know. Like, I don't want to watch it. <laughs> um, Faye Ray is good in this movie too, by the way. Oh, she's great. Like, That's why I scene, say she's not given a lot. The scene where um, she has to basically act in front of a tennis ball <laughs> you know there and when I'm, I'm talking about like when they're still on the ship when they haven't met kong yet and roger's like let's just do some screen tests i'm going to tell you what to do and you're going to emote like she sells it you know it's like that scene in mulholland drive where uh, uh naomi watts is at like a um at an audition and she starts like acting this intense scene with this guy and they both get so into it that you like forget that like they're just in an audition space and you start like being invested in this scene, mm -hmm. you know, like I think that that's how good Faye Ray's, how convincing Faye Ray's acting is in that moment. Yeah. Um, any, any final thoughts before we, we leave? Um, not really. I feel like I've said most of them. Um, we haven't, maybe we haven't given enough uh, credit to the dinosaur animation, which is also really good. Yeah. Again, like my favorite chunk of the movie is Kong v. Dinosaurs <laughs> in the second part. Um, and that's all just really cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad I watched it. It's definitely one of those like homework movies that you need to watch at one point or another if you're going to be a informed film person. Um, and, and I would so watch yeah. it if I'm, if you're like into animation or things like that. Yeah. At least watch it yeah. on that level because I think I, I find it to be a pretty crucial animation touchstone yeah i'm watch. trying to think of like what are the animation touchstones before this um i was thinking about like probably the lost some World of the bit. some of the milius stuff might qualify yeah right? some of the milius stuff but then the lost world is 
that's what Willis O'Brien worked on a little bit before. Mm. Um, yeah. And that one's, we've had that one on the young critics list a few times that hasn't looked. Have you seen it? Hmm. Mm. Bastards won't vote for it. Well, maybe next year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I think it's one, so at least watch it once. It's not like it's a long movie. Um, yeah. Watch it once. It's kind of, it's one of those. It's worth it for Kong v. Dinosaur and the, and the whole, you know, the whole New York Empire State Building sequence. King Kong or Godzilla, Zach? Um, I definitely like the the original Godzilla more. We needed yeah. we needed Seth on here to be our giant creature. I know we need our kaiju expert. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think Godzilla is both the better movie and the better monster. IMO. Less racism and sexism too, which is big. Yeah. Movie. That's a plus. Um, all right, I'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter and Instagram at handle at cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com where we list all the movies that we talked about in this episode. If you would like to support the show, whether it's $5 or $1, uh, head over to patreon.com slash cinematary uh, to, uh, to donate. Thank you so much to our patrons, Cam, Chad Newsom, Corey Willingham, Kena Sisson, Ron Hayes, Teresa Marthasafi, Titus Arthur, and Tyler Chandler. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Next week, uh, like we alluded to, we're going to be talking about the 1937 film The Tale of the Fox, because we're just it's 1930s stop motion animation, I guess. That's, That's right. 1920s are all about German expressionism. 1930s are all about stop motion animation, people. And uh, the 40s are just going to be about grifting. We got the treasure of Sierra Madre <laughs> and Bicycle Thieves. <laughs> Hell yeah. I guess I should be on that Bicycle Thieves episode since uh, was it call you, you or Michael wanting me to call you out? out? Yeah, no, I called you. I don't remember talking about that on the show at any point, but I could be wrong. I distinctly, I think it was super early. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. It was during the, you hated La Dolce Vita. I hated La Dolce Vita. Yeah. That's true. And, and, so, saying, yeah. and so I purposefully used my. Uh, my my imminent power to mm. put an Italian movie on because okay. one we never talk about Italian movies for whatever reason we don't I'll be back for that one okay um, until then thank you all for listening we'll see you next week bye.